You know, I think it's one of the hardest things to do. I think one of the hardest things to do is to say, I'm sorry. And not like when you bump into somebody on the street and you're like, oh, sorry, sorry, didn't see you there. That's not hard. It's hard to say I'm sorry when it actually matters. Like when my wife comes to me or one of my kids come to me and say, hey, daddy or honey, you hurt my feelings. It's hard to say I'm sorry then. It's hard to own up to a, a mistake. And I don't know why that is. I don't know if it's because I just don't like the idea that I did something wrong. I don't know if it's, I don't like the idea of indebting myself to somebody else. Hey, hey, I, I need forgiveness. But it's hard. And today, as we look at the last trial of Jesus before Pilate, and really before everybody, I think the whole crew is there, we're going to look at how forgiveness needs to be a part of our, uh, a part of our Easter, part of our Holy Week. Confession and repentance become an essential part of what it means to follow Jesus with our lives. And so today we're going to be in John uh, chapter 19. We're also going to look at Luke 23. And I want to answer three questions about forgiveness. And the first one is this, who needs to be forgiven? Like who even needs to be forgiven? Verse one of chapter 19, and then Pilate took Jesus and flogged him and the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head and arrayed him in a purple robe. And they came up to him saying, hail king of the Jews and struck him with their hands. And Pilate went out again and said to them, see, I'm bringing him out to you that you may know that I find no guilt in him. And so Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate said to them, behold, the man. And when the chief priest and the officers saw him, they cried out, crucify him, crucify him. And Pilate said to them, take him yourselves and crucify him, for I find no guilt in him. And the Jews answered him, we have a law. And according to that law, he ought to die because he made himself the son of God. And when Pilate heard this statement, he was even more afraid. He entered into his headquarters and said to Jesus, where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. And so Pilate said to him, you will not speak to me. Do you not know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? And Jesus answered him, you would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin." It's a lot there, a lot I'd like to cover, but I want to focus in on the last sentence there. The one who handed you over has the greater sin. So apparently there's a, a, a sin that can be apportioned out. Now, the one that's probably the most guilty here is probably Caiaphas. He's the mastermind behind all of this. Him and, uh, him and his father-in-law, Annas, are probably working behind the scenes. Pilate has a slice of the, the, the pie as well, the guilt of Jesus' uh, uh, trial. But there's other people that are guilty as well. And you see them in the text. You've seen them over the last several weeks. There's the soldiers, right? They're beating Jesus. They're mocking Jesus. They're making fun of him. Mocking his very real claims. And what I learned about the soldiers this week is that they're from a class of people probably called the Peregrini. The Peregrini were a group of Romans that didn't come from Italy. They're not Roman citizens. They're immigrants. They're not supposed to be in Jerusalem. They signed up for the army for who knows why. Maybe they were blue collar workers that just wanted uh, to see the world or they wanted to take a, a burden of feeding them off of their family. And so they're from all over the empire. You've got Pilate. I'm not gonna talk much about him. We've spent a lot of time talking about Pilate. He's a white collar bureaucrat. He's climbing the ladder. We don't know what his ambitions were, his ultimate ambitions, but maybe he wanted to be emperor. Maybe he thought he could climb that high. You've got the religious elite, the Sanhedrin, they're there. The educated, the religious, the brilliant, the well-read. You've got students and interns that are there. If you've got religious leaders, anytime you have scholars, you've got interns, right? Can't do your own footnotes. You've got craftsmen, you've got women, you've got children. And it shouldn't be all that hard to look into this sea of people, metaphorically speaking, of course, and see yourself there. Because you can find somebody who's like you. You can find somebody you identify with. Are you a blue collar worker? You were there in the craftsman, the tradesman. Craftsmen put together the whips that beat Jesus. Uh, craftsmen put together the cross. Are you a white collar worker? Hello, Pontius Pilate. Might be somebody, the kind of person that you have lunch with regularly. You might be that kind of person. Are you an immigrant? Are you from somewhere not native to Texas or, or to the United States? Guess what? 
You're just like those soldiers. Shouldn't have even been there maybe, but they found themselves there that day. Are you an educated person? Are you a Sunday school teacher, connect group teacher? Welcome to the Sanhedrin. They've got a spot for you. You can go on and on and on. And you might say, well, Travis, okay, I get it. Like, I get how I'm kind of there, tangentially speaking. I see what you're doing. That's cute. But you know what happens when, um, so I'm a big Atlanta Braves fan, as y'all know. Season started up this week. Praise God. And when I see my team win, you know what I say? I don't say, oh, the Braves won. I don't say they won. You know what I say? We won. I don't put on a uniform. I don't play for them. And if they ever needed me, it would be a very sad state of affairs for the Atlanta Braves. But you and I have the same level of affiliation. Our team was there that day. We are all guilty. We all need forgiveness, every single one of us. Because we would have done the exact same things because our representatives did the exact same things. So what do we need to be forgiven for? What do we need forgiveness for? Let's take a look back at the text. Verse 12, from then on, Pilate sought to release him. But the Jews cried out, if you release this man, you are not Caesar's friend. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. So when Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judgment seat at a place called the Stone Pavement and in Aramaic, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about the sixth hour. And he said to the Jews, behold your king. And they cried out, away with him, away with him, crucify him. And Pilate said to them, shall I crucify your king? And the chief priest answered, we have no king but Caesar. And so he delivered him over to them to be crucified. Pilate finally gets outmaneuvered because they say, if you don't crucify this man, you're allowing a puppet, you're allowing a rebel and an insurrectionist to live, to keep going. And so Pilate finally gives in, but he doesn't stop making fun of them. He doesn't stop ridiculing the people because he brings out this this king who's beaten, abused, he's bloody, probably both eyes are swelled shut at this point. He hasn't been flogged to the point that he will be later on, but he is a sad state for a king. And Pilate says, this is your king. You beaten down, oppressed people. This is the best king you could hope for. This weak shell of a man. You want me to crucify him for you? And they say, absolutely. And what they say is even more tragic than that because they go the full way. And they say, what? We have no king but Caesar. Their rejection isn't just of Christ the Messiah at that point. They've gone the full way And they've done the very thing that they accuse Jesus of doing. They blaspheme the name of God. In 1 Samuel 10, it says uh, that the people wanted a king. They cry out to God for a king. And it says this. They say, today you have rejected your God who saves you from all your calamities and distresses. And you have said to him, set a king over us. This is happening all over again. Exact same thing again. God, Yahweh, you are not a good enough king for us. We want somebody that we can hold on to. We want somebody real that we can hold on to and trust. We have no king but Caesar. And this is something that in our hearts at different times in my life, different times in my day, I find myself doubting the security of Christ, doubting the reliability of Jesus, doubting whether or not he's the kind of king that can rise up to meet the challenges of my day. I mean, Nobody would blame you. If you watched the news this week and you saw the shooting that took place in Nashville, those are our brothers and sisters in Christ, and your reaction was, where were you on that, Jesus? Are you still bound? Are you still on the cross? Are you still nailed there? Could you not have stopped this? Couldn't you have done something? In those moments, nobody would blame you for thinking Jesus seems like a mighty weak mockery of a king. And it's in times like that, unfortunately, it's not even in times that are that extreme, that difficult. Oftentimes in the first bit of trouble, the first bit of stress, the first bit of difficulty, we find ourselves trying to install a new king in our lives because Jesus doesn't seem equal to the task. He seems like that bloody shell of a man. And so we join in the chorus with the, with the rest of the leaders saying, we have no king but, they said Caesar. It's like a mad lib. We just throw in another word there. 
We have no king but security. We have no king but comfort. We have no king but wealth. We have no king but security. We have no king uh, but our friends or our family. We have no king but our job. We have no king but our sex life. We have no king but, and this is why we need to be forgiven because we install puppet kings all the time. It's a habit for us. And good kings, strong kings, when they are confronted with a rival, do you know what they do? They put the king down, the rival king. They have to, because the kingdom won't stand divided. Jesus says this. It brings civil war, it brings anarchy. The king has to put this rebellion down. And so the only hope we have is to go to the king, the real king, and say, I am sorry I backed the wrong one. I installed a new king. And this isn't something that just happens once in our life. Like I said, I do this a lot. I find myself trusting in things that are not the real king. And so it begs the question, how can we be forgiven if we repeatedly do this? Not just once. It's obviously a condition of my heart. I have this habit, this thing that goes, I go back to again and again and again. There's something broken in me that insists on false kings. So how? How am I forgiven? We look at verse 20, chapter 23 of Luke, verse 13. Pilate then called together the chief priests and the rulers and the people and said to them, you brought me this man as one who was misleading the people. And after examining him before you, behold, I did not find this man guilty of any of your charges against him. Neither did Herod, for he sent him back to us. Look, nothing deserving death has been done by him. I will therefore punish and release him. But they all cried out together, away with this man and release to us Barabbas a man who had been thrown into prison for an insurrection started in the city and for murder. Pilate addressed them once more, desiring to release Jesus, but they kept shouting, crucify, crucify him. And the third time he said to them, why? What evil has he done? I have found in him no guilt deserving death. I will therefore punish and release him. But they were urgent, demanding with loud cries that he should be crucified, and their voices prevailed. So Pilate decided that their demand should be granted he released the man who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder for whom they had asked, but he delivered Jesus over to their will. We turn to the close of the story, and Pilate tries one last effort. He presents to them two men, Jesus and a man called Barabbas, who's basically a domestic terrorist. And some manuscripts and some church history seems to say that Barabbas actually has a first name. It's Jesus. Basically, Pilate is saying, which Jesus do you want? You want this Jesus, the one who claims to be a king, your teacher, seems to do really nice things for you, or this, this guy, Jesus, who's a murderer and an insurrectionist? Do you want the prince of peace or a prince of chaos? Do you want the author of life or do you want a destroyer of it? Which Jesus do you want? And it should come as absolutely no surprise that the king that they choose or the Jesus that they choose is the one that's most like them, violent, angry, rebellious. We tend to think this is how Jesus is. We have this image of Jesus as kind of standing over us, mildly disappointed in us, frustrated with us. We have God, a God who is wrathful and checks boxes and, and kind of stands over us with a, with a grading card. We make jokes about God's going to strike us with lightning. Where do you think that comes from? Where do we get this idea that God's just poised with a lightning bolt ready to strike us dead? You know where I think it comes from? I think it comes from this. That's an artistic representation of the statue of Zeus at Olympia. Zeus was the god of thunder, the god of lightning in Greek mythology. Look at that picture. He's in a throne, stern, the old man with the beard, right? I mean, you, if I didn't tell you it wasn't Yahweh, you wouldn't know based on the way we think of God, right? This old man in a robe. Zeus is a little more chiseled probably than we give God credit for. He's got a spirit of victory in one hand, a staff of judgment in the other, and that's what we think God is. But look at the great art. You know the great art that we make of Jesus? The ones you can't get out of your head, the ones you know by name, like this in Brazil. It's Christ the Redeemer. See how different it is? What about this next one? It's La Pieta. It's one of the most beautiful statues in the world. 
What about this next one? You all know it. It's the Last Supper. Look at how Jesus is sitting. Look at his arms. Look at this last one. In every single one of these, Jesus is vulnerable. He's exposed. His arms are open. You know why Jesus isn't holding anything? It's hard to hold something when your hands are bound. It's hard to hold something when your hands are nailed to a cross. You can't hold something. Have you ever tried to give somebody a really great hug, but your hands were full? It's awkward, right? Jesus' hands are empty because he wants to embrace you. He wants you to come to him for forgiveness. He wants you to repent. He wants you to trust him by faith that he is not angry, that his anger is satisfied. The wrath of God is satisfied on the cross. You have been substituted. You want to find yourself in the crowd that day in Jerusalem? Guess what? You're not in the crowd. You're on the stand with Jesus. You're Barabbas. You're the insurrectionist. You're a cosmic terrorist. Every sin we commit, everything we do wrong, we are unraveling the delicate framework that God has created. We're doing damage to creation and others. And Jesus takes it all for us. He takes the wrath, he takes the punishment. And the father says, give me the one that's like Barabbas. I will substitute my son. And the only reason why, this is the only reason why we won't go to his open arms. Because your arms aren't open to you're holding on to stuff. You're holding on to your false kings. You're holding on to your guilt. You're holding on to your shame. You're holding on to your past. You're holding on to your pride. I don't know what it is, but you're holding on to something else and you can't embrace the Lord. And so today what we're gonna do is we're gonna just spend some more time in worship and we're gonna orient ourselves towards confession because this is a great season for confession. We're gonna offer up confession to the Lord, asking him to forgive us and repenting. And so we're gonna do that together today. So let's pray, and then we'll continue worshiping together. Father God, thank you that your arms are open wide to receive us, and that we are not held back from a relationship with you because of what we've done, but we are accepted because of what Christ has done for us, and that's a free gift offered to us. God, I pray that we would lean into that this morning, whether we've known you for two minutes or known you for two, two years or 20 years or whatever it is. May we rest in your grace this morning as we worship. It's in your name we pray, amen.